Many of John Donne's lyric poems address a person outside the poem. And so it's not so much thought, but it's almost a one-sided dialogue. And this is what's meant by the dramatic voice. If we turn to John Donne's The Rising Sun, we'll see how this dramatic voice is enacted in not just a conversational idiom, which is also surprising, but natural syntax. Syntax has to do with the grammatical order of the words and how the sense comes together. I'll explain more about what this means sure. shortly, but let's just read this poem. Surprising on a number of counts. Busy old fool, unruly son, why dost thou thus, through windows and through curtains, call on us? Whoa, this is not the language of Elizabethan lyric. We have a trochee here, instead of starting off on the, the, the rhythm I am, we have busy old fool. This is, I think, a spondy. Two stressed syllables. Uh, and I, have a, I have a video on meter if you want to check that out. But that's just to say a stressed syllable followed by an unstressed, stressed, stressed, unruly son. Okay, there we have two I am's here. But then look, two spondies, why dost thou thus? Every word in this line, monosyllabic, and every syllable is stressed. Why dost thou thus? Um, it's, it's very harsh and it's confronting. Not only that, but it's strange to address the sun this way. The sun, often a symbol of God himself or of the beauties of creation, often addressed ceremoniously. Edmund Spencer in his Fairy Queen will often describe, he'll open his cantos with uh, the rosy fingered dawn, hey, which he takes from Homer. Uh, very reverent, but here Dunn calls the son a busy old fool. More surprising, unruly. What can be more unruly than the sun? It regulates days, nights, seasons, but he's angry. He's got this insolence to the tone. He call, the sun is calling through curtains and, on win and through windows and through curtains to call on us. But notice, I mentioned syntax, which is the grammatical order. Instead of complicating that order, he has the address busy old fool, why do you call on us to simplify it? It's, it's the way you would order a sentence if you were naturally speaking. And now we find out why he's angry. Must to thy motions lovers seasons run? Saucy pedantic wretch. Go chide late schoolboys and sour prentices. Go tell court huntsmen that the king will ride. Uh, we, have, we have a clue here as to when this poem was written. It was certainly within the, within the reign of James the first, who was addicted to hunting. Uh, he loved to hunt, and so the speaker of this poem is saying, "Go tell the courtsmen that the king will ride. Go, 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 call on country ants to harvest offices. Go into the busyness of the world, but do not intrude upon this sacred space of love. Love, all alike, no season knows, nor clime, nor hours, days, months." which are the rags of time. He doesn't want the sun peeping in on the bed. He's there with us. We have this plural pro pronoun here. Uh, he's in bed with a woman waking up. Right, go call on someone else. Don't bother us and see how Dunn actually settles. He, he's very disruptive in his rhythm here, but he settles into iambic meter here, which are the rags of time interesting phrase, the rags of time. It comes up in one of his Christmas sermons uh, when he's much older. Okay, so what's surprising about this? Well, you have to know a little bit about the poetry before. Let me give you an example. So one of John Donne's contemporaries, Ben Johnson, said that Donne deserved hanging for not keeping accent. But keeping accent meant uh, having a regular rhythm. Let's look at, at Ben Johnson's. I want to show you an excerpt from his work. Okay, this is from Johnson's uh, drama, Volpone, Act 1, Scene 1. This is the opening scene. Volpone is saying good morning to his gold. Uh, he's in love with riches. But notice the rhythm here. And then I want to point out something about the syntax. This is what Dunn is going against. And this is what Johnson thinks good poetry is in Dunn's era. Good morning to the day. And next, my gold. Open the shrine that I may see my saint. Hail the world's soul and mine. The rhythm here is as we'd expect. Good morning to the day. And next, my gold. It's got a nice rhythm to it. We have a trochee here, but it settles again. 
Uh, we've got a beautiful linking of the long I sound here. Um, this is called assonance, the repetition of a vowel sound. We have the O in gold linking it to this O in soul. And of course, the world soul is the sun, but the gold is his soul. Now notice this syntactically. Think about where the subject is in this next sentence. More gold than is the teeming earth to see the longed-for sun peep through the horns of the celestial ram am I, to view thy splendor darkening his. This is complicated poetic diction, which is partly what Dunn is reacting against. What's meant by this? More glad than is the teeming earth to see the longed-for sun peep through the horns of the celestial ram am I. Basically, if you were to translate this into prose, He's saying, I am more glad to see my gold than the teeming earth is to see the longed for sun. And the splendor of the gold darkens the suns. Uh, so it's complex. It's not the way you'd naturally speak in conversation. So that's an example. Now let's return to Dunn's rising sun. Here we have subject, verb, usually follows in a natural conversational order. The dramatic voice continues here. Thy beams so reverent and strong, why shouldst thou think? Why should you think your beams so reverent and strong? I could eclipse and cloud them with a wink, but that I would not lose her sight so long. The sun could be eclipsed only with a wink, but that I would not lose her sight so long. If her eyes have not blinded thine, look, and tomorrow late tell me. Whether both the Indias of Spice and mine be where thou left them, or lie here with me. The two Indias, or both Indias, talking about the, the Americas and the actual India um, of the East, look and tell me if they're still there, or whether they lie with me. Ask for those kings whom thou sawest yesterday, and thou shalt hear, all here in one bed lay. Now this is borderline trees in it. I mean, it's, it's very irreverent. So the dramatic voice is often insolent or even blasphemous in some ways. Ask for those kings whom thou saw yesterday, and thou shalt hear that they are here in one bed. You know, he draws, he turns his attention to her. She's all states and all princes I. Notice uh, the pronomial division. First we had us, now we have she and I. And we have the pronouns here at the beginning and end of the line, almost making a uh, pronomial uh, epanalepsis and encircling, where you have the same word at the beginning and the end. Not quite. She's all states, all princes, I. And there's this symmetry you'll notice. Nothing else is. Here's, here's the quality of, of the dramatic voice for done speakers. Directness and often hyperbole or exaggeration. This is an all or nothing statement. Nothing else is. We are the only thing that exists. Princes do but play us compared to this all honors mimic, all wealth, alchemy. Alchemy had to do with the change of form and not essence and so there's this specious value uh, to wealth where there's a real value to them and their love. This is playing a bit on Platonic idealism the idea that the real forms are somewhere out there and that everything else is mimesis or mimicry, a copy of. Thou, son, art half as happy as we, in that the world's contracted thus. Thine age asks ease, since thy duties be to warm the world, and that's done in warming us. That, okay, you've done enough. Um, you are now irrelevant. Shine here to us and thou art everywhere. Now here's a different command. Instead of go away, he's saying you can perform all of your work here, since there's nothing else that exists. This bed thy center is, these walls thy sphere. This is part of the hyperbole that will come again in John Donne's The Good Morrow, as we'll see. But so you notice the quality of the dramatic voice. It's direct. It's uh, idiomatic. It's conversationally syntactic. And this is going against the Petrarchan and Elizabethan modes of lyric poetry. In a way, Dunn's natural diction and syntax anticipate what the Romantic movement would introduce with poetry that uh, uses the natural language of men, uh, to quote from Wordsworth's preface. 
So that's the dramatic voice. 